So since I uh, joined Penn State in 2002, um, I've been engaged in some projects to reduce tillage in organic farming systems. And um, so I want to tell you a little bit about those today, and I'm going to try to pull them together. In fact, I um, appreciate being invited here because it gave me a chance to kind of think about this whole sort of evolution of this work. And um, I just want to have a very brief um, introduction to describe what organic is, in case you don't know, you probably do, and what, why we're working on it, what the opportunities are for our growers, and then the evolution of these um, projects, which started with a trans transition project to organic in 2003, and um, it's still ongoing, but the first phase of this last reduced tillage organic systems experiment that we call the ROSE um, officially ended in 2014, and it's, it's ongoing still. And some of the lessons that we've learned um, during trying to reduce tillage in organic systems. And these are multidisciplinary projects that um, involve lots of um, scientists and postdocs and technicians and farmers. There, there's an on-farm component, um, and I won't be able to talk about that today. Um, so I want to acknowledge them. Um, so a lot of the work I'm going to present today are belongs to um, my graduate students, but also graduate students from some of my um, colleagues. So organic, um, since 2002, organic in the United States, if you want to use the word organic for production systems, it are, um, refers to production practices um, and substances that you, in accordance with the Organic Foods Production Act. Um, and some of the basic requirements for that or restrictions for uh, cropping systems are that GMOs, biosolids, and radiation are not allowed. Um, there's uh, provisions about soil management in the law, and um, soil management um, must uh, not damage soil. In fact, it should maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil. Uh, farming operations need distinct boundaries and buffers to prevent contact with prohibited substances and Organic um, planting stock seeds, seedlings need to be organic unless they're not commercially available in the quantity or quality that's um, required, um, but in no case can GMOs be used. They can be conventionally bred, um, conventional uh, growing stock or seed, but they, it cannot um, have any kind of chemical or seed treatments, treatment with uh, substances that aren't allowed in organic production. And then there's this requirement for very extensive record keeping and paperwork and an annual inspection. So that's like the elevator talk about what is organic. And so today, you know, I'm going to talk about reduced tillage. And so we're going to pay attention to this soil management that maintains, improves physical, chemical, and biological conditions of the soil. And so opportunities um, for our growers, one of the reasons that we're um, involved in this work is that uh, organic represents a tremendous growth area in uh, agriculture and it's growing at a much faster rate than the um, food system in general uh, between uh, about 83 percent between 2007 and 2012 and predicted to um, continue to grow and um, we are our uh, demand greatly uh, exceeds our supply of organic products. Okay, so one of the most important segments of the organic industry is organic milk and other animal products. And how does that relate to cropping systems? Well, all those organic animals need to eat 100% organic feed in forages and in feed grains. And so there's a tremendous demand for um, organic corn, soybeans, small grains, and uh, forages. Unfortunately, we do not um, come close to uh, uh, producing the amount of those feed grains, organic feed grains, that are being demanded by this growing livestock product industry. And so we um, import about 80 percent of our organic feed grains right now, um, mostly from places you might be surprised. <laughs> to learn that we import these organic grains from. Um, and so uh, imports of organic uh, corn represented about 33% of total corn imports of any kind, and organic soybeans about 31%. And soybeans are coming from 
these countries mostly here. And it's always sort of baffled me at first before I got what became engaged in this research is why aren't these growers seeing this as an opportunity because the um, price, there's a price premium for organic feed grains. Um, and it's been consistent over a long time. In fact, I looked this up last week, and these are the current commodity prices for organic and conventional. And corn is usually twice, usually around twice that of um, the organic price is usually about twice that of conventional. Soybeans between two and three times. Wheat varies. I've seen it as high as $18 per bushel. OK. On the other hand, um, production costs are higher in organic than in conventional. Even though we're not using synthetic inputs, um, the cost of capital, labor, and fuel are greater in organic systems than in conventional. So the total um, economic cost per bushel is higher for organic crops. Than, so even though they're getting these higher prices, the cost of production is also higher. Okay, so on to the um, soil health part of this now that we're caught up on uh, organic. So there's this tension. Uh, organic growers use a lot of tillage. And that's because we don't have, um, virtually we have no affordable, for field crops anyway, uh, pest management inputs, no sort of insecticides that really are economical to use on a um, field scale and field crops. And there are really no uh, effectively no herbicides either. And so tillage is used extensively for um, management of those fertility inputs, animal manures, green manures, um, and seed bed preparation and um, incorporation of residues. And we, all, we know from many, many years of work on um, no-till systems, conventional no-till systems, that this intensive tillage can degrade soil, it alters soil biology, um, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. You know, sometimes we use tillage to manage uh, diseases and pests, but other times we're um, uh, destroying beneficial organisms too. Uh, more importantly, it takes time and labor, uses energy, and really is in conflict with um, both the USDA National Organic Program standards and with NRCS regulation mandates to improve soil and natural resources to um, continue using this, these int um, intensive tillage practices. So when I first moved to um, Pennsylvania in 2002, the Rodale Institute um, in Pennsylvania was engaged in this research um, that they called um, no-till organic. And basically what it was is they were using overwintered cover crops and they were terminating those overwintered cover crops in the spring. Um, with this roller crimper. So they were crushing this down and making a big, thick mat of um, uh, cover crop residue, which is suppressive to weeds. And, uh, and then they would no-till plant into that very thick mat. And um, early on, they recognized that if they planted corn early, and this is early for Pennsylvania um, in an organic system, that their corn populations um, were very low and subsequently <coughs> the yields were very low um, in those early plant dates. And if they waited to plant until, oh, now I don't have a pointer either, <coughs> until later, until later dates, um, their yields and their populations and yields were better. And what was happening is that this, uh, Pest, black cutworm, um, which is an early season pest. The moth blows up on weather fronts in the spring. It moves north. And as it moves north, it's overpositing in uh, green vegetation. And so what was happening in those early dates is they were destroying that vegetation and planting. And as just at the perfect time for these cutting stages, the third instar larvae, um, to be present, and in this heavy residue, um, these larvae were really chopping off the corn plants. OK, thanks. So this seemed like an entomological problem. <laughs> so we um, sought funding and were successful to look at this um, rolled uh, cover crop system 
for corn and soybeans. And so all of the, the three projects, they do have some common objectives. And I'm going to go through the common objectives and methods first, and then I'll go give you some details about the individual projects. They're really all based on this organic feed and forage rotation, corn, soybean, wheat, and in one of the projects we also have alfalfa and um, orchard grass. They've, really the focus is on weed management. Weed, weeds are the number one pest in organic systems and also on soil quality, but they also address these insect pest and beneficial organisms, crop productivity and economic indicators. There are also education and extension components where we're gathering this information from our own research and from other research and um, incorporating them into materials for extension, um, for um, materials and activities that we can distribute. And then there was also very much a strategic objectives for these um, experiments, especially, especially the first one, um, because the history of, like at many land grants, um, of Penn State, their relationship with the organic community, it would be charitable to say it was really horrible. Right? Um, when I first arrived at Penn State, uh, the director of our local organic uh, NGO came and gave me a piece of her mind, like, as soon as I met her. <laughs> so it was very bad. And so we wanted to improve that um, relationship. Um, establish certified organic land at Penn State because there is federal money to actually work on organic, but you need organic land to do that, to be competitive. And so, um, and also to increase the level of awareness of the, of the Penn State community. There had been a little bit of organic uh, research um, at Penn State, as with many land grants um, in the past, but really not very much. And so there was a general, like, not understanding of what organic is and what the um, benefits might be to Pennsylvania growers. Okay, so um, these um, reduced tillage experiments, we have a lot of uh, measures in common um, between the experiments. We're um, using pitfall traps to uh, sample soil arthropods. We're using some sentinel baiting methods to detect um, soil entomopathogens. There are, uh, my colleagues are collecting information on weeds and crop and cover crop biomass and yield, and we also have involved ec economists. And then because soil quality <clears throat> is really a big focus of these projects, we have this whole raft of um, soil measures for uh, soil fertility and soil physical properties um, that can affect organisms that live in, in soil. Okay, so I'm going to really focus on the entomological work, and this, these are our core measurements. We've done some other ki kinds of things too, but I'm going to focus on these um, pitfall traps again um, to uh, survey the um, soil dwelling or soil associated arthropods, and in general we ID uh, arthropods to order or family, whichever we're able to do easily, and then carabids to species and trophic groups. We use a sentinel uh, assay with Galeria melanella um, to assess predation potential of these systems. And um, what we do is we fasten these poor Galeria onto little cards, and we put them in this hardware cloth cage in the field, and then we come back later and see who got eaten or damaged. And so that's how we measure that. Um, we have some emergence traps that are made of planter boxes with a little glass um, jar on top. And this is to capture insects that are emerging from the soil. And mostly we're worried about early season pests like seed corn maggot. Um, and then we use also Galeria melanella to assay soil for entomopathogens. And the, we found a number of different um, fungi, some really cool ones, um, but really our most commonly um, observed fungus is metarhizium, which is a uh, infects insects. Okay, so I'm calling these reduced tillage experiments, but really that covers a pretty broad swath of types of practices and equipment that range from very intensive level of tillage that um, really disrupts the soil and 
turns it over with moldboard plow, um, and that ranges through with different kinds of equipment and approaches, all the way down to no-till, and those are associated with um, very low levels of residue left on the surface, um, all the way down to quite a lot of residue left on the surface, and um, differing levels of intensity and frequency of soil disturbance. So it's sort of hard to analyze these things and just say, well, it's reduced tillage or it's no-till, depending on um, exactly what we're doing. So not all conservation systems are the same and they can affect any measure um, differently. And in addition, you know, these systems may or may not include cover crops in the rotation, which can also uh, influence the results. So just recently, I mean, this has just been the last few months, I've been thinking about, well, how can I analyze this data again? <laughs> um, but somehow at least take a first stab at quantifying this, these treatments, because we do use different kinds of implements that we call reduced till or full till. And so NRCS has this um, rating system. It's called Soil Disturbance Rating System. And it gives a, a rating, a disturbance rating, based on the action of different implements on the soil, inversion, mixing, lifting, shattering, aerating, and compaction. And while this might not be perfect, at least it's pretty repeatable and somebody it's something I can refer to. So it's sort of standardized. And so these are all these ratings are from zero to five, with zero being not disturbing and five being the most disturbing. And so you end up with this composite rating at the end. Say, for example, moldboard plow is a 29, so that's 30 would be the highest disturbance rating you could get all the way down to our cover crop roller, which is a four. And I think some harvesting equipment is like a three. I think three is our lowest. So, okay, so that takes care of the, um, the sort of disturbance factor. But, you know, intensity and frequency are important. It's not just that you use this piece of equipment, but how often did you use it? And so what we do is we add up <clears throat> how much of this soil disturbance we have for a year for the growing season for a particular treatment, and then we can also accumulate it through the whole rotation. These experiments all last three or four years. And so we can look at what happens over time as these disturbances um, add up. Um, and so we can have both the annual and rotation number of disturbances or this disturbance rating. And then there's also this temporal effects. You know, we take the, all these different samples on different schedules. And so it might not be on this annual schedule that covers the whole year. And so we can have how many days there have been since the last disturbance and how many of these SDR or number of disturbances happened to a prior sample. So there's a lot of different ways you can count these beans, right, um, to see, to try to get at quantitatively what is the effect of these different practices. And so here are the annual values for these three different experiments that I'm going to talk about. And so they go through time. And you can see we have incrementally improved or reduced sort of the number of disturbances through the whole rotation. Um, here's the three year for this one. This particular project lasted four years. But, you know, each year we, the range of uh, disturbances is getting a little less and uh, the soil disturbance rating also is um, diminishing as we try to work out ways to uh, reduce tillage. And so the first, um, experiment that I'm going to talk about was our first. Our, we were all bright-eyed and naive about reducing tillage in organic systems. And this was a transition experiment. It started out as um, land that had been used for a conventional tomato breeding project that was had a lot of inputs, a lot of uh, pesticides, uh, fungicide, well, insecticides, fungicides, synthetic uh, fertilizers. And so we initiated this transition with um, two cover crops, either a, a sod type cover crop, Timothy and red clover, or a grain type cover crop, um, cereal rye and hairy vetch. And then we followed that the next two years. In the next year, we um, planted soybeans and the third year corn. And each of these, they should be split in half. They, it was a factorial with full tillage or reduced tillage. So they started with either 
the grain cover crop and then were managed with full tillage or reduced tillage and the same in corn or they were initiated with a, a sod cover crop <clears throat> and then managed with full or reduced tillage. And our reduced tillage, we managed this cover crop with um, a roller crimper, this one with a chisel plow. So our reduced tillage in this sense, full tillage was mold bore plow and disc and field cultivator. Reduced tillage was a chisel plow, which does not invert the soil in a field cul cultivator. And so here is sort of the, uh, the add up of the number of dist disturbances and the disturbance rating. And you can see there's, so what we think it's reduced till, but really, so the full till Timothy Clover system has the same kind amount of disturbance as the reduced till rye vetch system. So this is another reason why maybe it doesn't make sense always to call things by their treatment names, but to characterize them in some other way. So, um, on the insect side, it was actually really good news. We didn't have much in the term in, in the way of pest insect pressure, um, but what we did notice was that our, um, our arthropods increased through time in every system, um, be it full tillage or reduced tillage. Um, tillage was not significant here, and so arthropods increased, but predators also increased, and carabids increased through time, through the rotation. So we expected insects would increase, um, but we thought we might get some pest increase, and we did not um, experience that. It seemed to be mostly beneficial. And so this is um, a biplot for uh, the principal response curve. And if you're not familiar with them, principal response curve is basically a multiple regression through time. It's telling you what's happening with the insect community. So we have this big um, data set with insect community, and it, these lines sort of signify changes that are happening in that insect community over time. And these ratings over here are the organisms that are really fitting the pattern of this change. And you always have to choose one uh, treatment as your control. And so we picked what nominally was, we thought was our least um, disturbed system, which was the uh, system that uh, was initiated with the Timothy red clover and then managed with reduced tillage as our control. And so these are changes that happen in the community relative to that system. And so what this shows is that the um, systems that begin with rye, these communities are similar at the beginning, and these systems that begin with Timothy are similar in the, in, at the beginning in those crops. But as we go through the rotation, tillage becomes more important. And these um, communities are more similar by tillage than they are by initial cover crop. And these are the groups that are really fitting the pattern of this change. And so you can tell which organisms are changing in this pattern. OK. And so basically what that says, in the, in the transition, the effect of tillage on arthropods is variable, and that some predators tolerate tillage. And we know that from conventional systems, but it's working the same way in organic systems. Okay, so this is um, these are biplots from forward selection multivariate um, regression um, in a program called Canico, which is a can canonical correlation um, package, and it can show us which environmental or um, which environmental factors are um, associated with particular organisms, or in this case, groups of organisms. I've grouped them by trophic group and just by general arthropod activity density. Um, activity density is what we call abundance in pitfall traps. And so we can see that um, soil moisture is um, quite an important factor in the community and that we have carnivorous um, carabids and omnivorous carabids associated with this. These vectors that are close to each other and going in the same direction are positively associated, and those that go in opposite directions are negatively um, associated. For example, down here with the weeds, 
we, this is the annual um, soil disturbance rating is um, a vector that is um, going in the opposite direction as the annual weed density. And so makes sense, right? The more disturbance you have, um, the fewer annual weeds you have. Um, this was interesting that calcium came up as an important environmental factor for weeds um, and seems to be associated with uh, perennial weeds. And so using this kind of analysis, we can um, look at the effects of disturbance and also the effects of these many different, um, these many environmental variables that we measured. Okay, so at the end of that exper experiment, the reason I said our naive, bright-eyed um, attempt at reducing tillage was that um, when you remove really tillage at all from an organic system, if you have in your environment perennial weeds, such as Canada thistle, you end up with a very big Canada thistle problem. These are soybeans, that brown stuff. And that is Canada thistle right there in this Timothy reduced till treatment in year three. So that presented us, well, that told us, well, the way we decided to reduce tillage through the whole rotation will not work. Okay, transition is risky. And so you can also see that in our yields where we had reduced tillage, we have lower yields than in where we have uh, full tillage in corn, soybean, not so important, but um, corn, it really mattered. And if you look at our net returns through our that uh, transition uh, rotation, um, where we have that rye initial cover crop, we lose money right off the bat. And th this rotation was actually designed with a farmer advisory board. And we did harvest the rye for grain and for um, forage. And we harvested the Timothy red clover for forage. So we were able to make some money there. In fact, we made the most money um, in that first season with the forages. We lost money in every system on um, the soybean. We got some money back um, in the full tillage um, systems in corn. And then for, so when you add all that up for the whole rotation, we only uh, made a profit in our, um, in the uh, systems that started with um, Timothy. So this to us, now we're starting to understand why a lot of farmers aren't running to transition to organic. During that transition period, it's um, obviously very risky and financially risky, and there are you do not um, earn a price premium for transitional crops. Only once your crops are fully certified, which takes three years. Okay, so out of that um, project, we developed another one um, because this. This uh, thistle problem pre presented an opportunity, we decided, um, was that for this post-transition project, weed management, environmental quality, and profitability in organic feed and forage systems, or how to clean up Canada thistle once you've made sort of a big mess. And so our hypothesis was that by rotating soil disturbance with soil building activities, that over the rotation, we would be able to bring our perennial weeds under control while maintaining or improving soil quality, maintaining productivity, and continuing to conserve these beneficial insects, which seemed to be happy enough in that organic system, whether it was tilled or not, and to try to gain or maintain some profitability and at least not lose money. And now, in this experiment, we are certified organic, so our um, our crops can be sold at a price premium that organic um, is available to organic growers. And so um, this, we really went crazy. <laughs> it's a very complicated. So this, um, so there were those four factorial systems of reduced till by initial cover crop in that first experiment. And so this is um, where we ended that first experiment. Some of them were, two of the treatments had reduced tillage, two of them had full tillage. And then we developed the systems from there. And 
in system one, we front loaded. Okay, so, so they all start with a tillage event and then a rye and hairy vetch cover crop. Um, and then we front loaded system one with a lot of disturbance and a lot of um, diver diversity of cover crops to try to clean that up because this is a reduced tillage um, coming out of reduced tillage. So we had a lot of thistle. So we're doing that. Then we follow with a fallow and then where the stars are, are where in the rotation now we're going to reduce tillage again um, to try to gain back from some of the damage that we may have caused in that very intensively managed stage. And then um, in the system two, we start the same way. Um, we have a little bit less intensive management here at the beginning. And because um, we're going into this um, longer fallow period, we um, applied manure. It's coming out of this full tillage system. We don't have such a, a, a thistle problem. and Again, then we follow with the alfalfa or gra orchard grass. In the uh, reduced, coming out of this system three, the reduced tillage, again, we start with the rye and hairy vetch. And this was supposed to be wheat, but this is another point that I'll bring up in the organic systems. Your cover crops can become weeds themselves. And so we could not adequately control rye with the roller crimper. And so we were kind of stuck with rye as our following crop, small grain crop instead of wheat. And then we planted into that rolled rye, triticale and hairy vetch. So this is like all cover crop, which a farmer would not do. But this is just what happened. And then we follow that with um, corn, where we tried to no-till this corn into this rolled hairy, um, triticale and hairy vetch. System four. We um, start with a full tillage system, again, a, a tillage event, rye hairy vetch. Um, again, we could not adequately control our rye and hairy vetch. Um, so we ended that and terminated that with a tillage event and planted uh, full till corn. And because there's so much going on here, these different systems, that it was just like, what can we think of to control um, uh, Canada thistle? We ended the rotation with a uniformity trial. We just tilled everything and planted soybeans across the, um, across the systems. And so that if there was a legacy, we could detect if there is a legacy of this rotation in this final year of soybeans. Because otherwise, it's very difficult, except you, know, you can maybe compare between alfalfa or between corn. But really, that's about it for this rotation. And so here are the uh, soil disturbance ratings for these different treatments. So there is some variability in the number of disturbances in those. And even though this has a big, long chunk of alfalfa in here, the disturbance values are quite high um, because we front loaded that with a lot of disturbance. So even though I would have, without adding this up, thought these are our re more reduced tillage systems, there actually are more disturbed systems. So similar to our um, initial uh, transition, uh, we do get an increase in arthropods through time. So they continue to increase in that second phase of um, the rotation after the transition. They're a little flat um, here in this uh, system with the, a lot of uh, the reduced till, full till, reduced till with um, annual crops. But in every system, what happened is when we went to that uniformity trial with soybeans, the insect populations crashed. So we had tillage and then, um, and then um, planting of soybeans. So there's something about soybeans, and I've seen this in many of our um, experiments. Our insect populations in general, the um, herbivorous insects and the um, predatory insects are very low populations in uh, soybeans compared to other, our other, the other crops that we grow. This again is from a um, principal response curve. It's a little bit more complicated, but it, so we use system one as our, um, which was the reduced till, full till alfalfa as our control. And here at the end is our year four, our soybean uniformity trial. This is the beginning. Here's our um, 
systems that began from the previous experiment and reduced till, the communities are very similar according to tillage. That's what these lines together here mean. This started as full till. And then as soon as um, we start implementing those different systems, they start diverging. And the communities that um, were corn in the third year become more similar, whether they've been in this, um, whether they've been treated differently with um, disturbance or not. And this is our alfalfa um, orchard grass system. It's not diverging as much from system one, which is alfalfa. And so what, and then here's the soybean where everything is starting to become similar again with that similar, uh, similar management. And so, so what we're seeing from this is yes, the past, uh, Management does shape the community, but that the, um, the current year's management really has a, as you would expect, a huge effect. And so we don't have a huge legacy effect. We have a little bit of a legacy effect. These lines aren't coming all together exactly um, for this community in the uniformity trial, but they are all starting to converge um, together. And so these are the, um, the, um, organisms or response variables that are responsible for these patterns and um, so annual weeds, uh, the different trophic groups of the carabids and um, the fungus that we look at, metarhizium. Okay, and so for our yields, our um, systems with annuals in the uniformity trial, there was a legacy of lower yields compared to those that were preceded by alfalfa. And what um, this was probably due to was that um, in the systems with a lot of um, disturbance, we had lower levels of um, weeds. And let's see, weed biomass was inversely uh, correlated with yields in the soybean. And the uh, soybean yields in system one and two were greater than systems three and four. Three and four had the annual. So the mowing of the alfalfa helped suppress the weeds. And so the, this mowing of the alfalfa was probably more important than this disturbance from tillage. System uh, two at the end, this is net present value or sort of the financial period at the end, these error bars represent different price scenarios, low, medium, and high um, price scenarios for this. So again, we ended up, we were losing money at the beginning. Um, we're gaining money except in this system four where we had all the um, regrowth of the rye. And then uh, as we move through the rotation, we do start to um, have income and in the end, uh, system two was the best, and that was with the alfalfa grass, and that really was because of our ability to sell forages, organic forages in that system. Okay, so, so better than, in terms of uh, profitability than our uh, initial transition, but still not great and still a lot of disturbance. And so we, um, decided to um, move sites and try something else. <laughs> and this uh, third project is really based on the use of the roller crimper and trying to optimize that and not so much rotate this tillage, just these different levels of um, disturbance and perennial crops. So this is just a, th a three year annual grain rotation and we're using the um, roller crimper to terminate cover crops in the spring, these overwintering cover crops. So that eliminates spring tillage. And then we no-till um, plant cash crops, either corn or soybean, into that cover crop mulch. And in the variable in this experiment was planting date, was the um, date on which we um, terminate these cover crops and then plant um, the cash crops into the, that cover crop mulch. To see, and really the focus of this was on, um, again, weeds, soil quality, and then also the insects uh, yield and profitability. 
There was also a treatment, high residue cultivation, and that sort of cultivation uses sweeps and it undercuts uh, the weeds um, in a high residue situation. And if there's a mulch on the surface, it doesn't disturb the mulch on the surface. It leaves that mulch pretty much um, in place, but it does um, cut the roots of wheat, uh, weeds under the mulch. And this had no effect on insects, so I'm not going to um, report anything on that. Uh, there were three varieties based on three varieties of each um, cash crop, the corn and soybean. Um, and we only did entomological uh, measures in this standard cultivated planted on these three dates. But we also had treatments where we used these variable length cultivars that were appropriate for the date. So where the uh, crop was planted late, we would plant a short season corn. And where it was planted earlier, we would plant a longer season corn. But there was a standard cultivate, uh, cultivar planted on all the dates. And this is, um, covers about 15 acres. And so this is what it looks like when we roll down these cover crops um, <clears throat> with this roller crimper. And then we're planting into that biomass. This is uh, uh, triticale and hairy vetch. And this is the cereal rye um, in which we're going to plant soybeans. And you can see what that um, residue looks like when uh, the cash crops are emerging. It leaves quite a heavy uh, residue. And to get this kind of a residue that represent, and to be able to suppress weeds, you need about a biomass of about uh, 4,000 pounds, at least 4,000 pounds of biomass per acre. And so in this system, you have to pay a lot of attention to getting a very good uh, overwintering cover crop uh, stand to be able to uh, suppress weeds. <coughs> Okay, so these are the dominant. Um, oh, there, oh, there. These are the dominant predators that um, we found in this system. Um, spiders were uh, the most numerous, um, followed by staphylinids, carabids, ants, daddy long legs, and crickets, coccinellids less, but really spiders were our most um, frequently detected predators. And as we saw in the other two um, experiments, so I'm feeling very confident about this kind of, that organic management does result in increased arthropod abundance, in, including beneficial arthropods, is um, that as you move through the rotation, th this is for um, carabids, we have a significant increase in carabids. When we look at particular carabids, with um, the different systems. This is soybean, plant date one, plant date two, plant date three, corn, plant date one, plant date two, plant date three. And these are the wheat uh, systems. We can see that there are particular um, taxa that respond differently to those different um, management dates. Of um, These were all sampled at the same time, but the communities are uh, different. Well, the wheat was not sampled at the same time. but And so in that hairy vetch triticale corn system, we have these species of um, uh, carabids. And with the rye, soy, uh, really fewer are, um, species are associated with that. And there, are, there were many species. These are only the ones that are um, really strongly associated with a particular systems. We, we have a tiger beetle that um, was very strongly associated with that. This is from one of the predation assays that just show that as you increase the total predator abundance or activity density, you also increase the proportion of predation on the, in those sentinel assays so that um, our increase in predators in these systems is translating to um, potentially, in our sentinel assays anyway, an increase in predation. And um, we're assuming that that probably also happens to just um, predation in general in these systems. 
So even though we get this increase in beneficial insects and an increase in predation in these systems, um, that does not translate into differences in yield. Uh, we don't have a lot of um, pest pressure in these systems and um, other factors seem to be more important. We did have lower yields in those late planted soybeans and um, that's just because of uh, not enough season probably to grow a good crop. But the um, first two plant dates or the across plant dates for corn seem yields seem to be um, similar. The best date for termination of those cover crops and getting good control was the middle date. And we've gone on with this middle date system in a, in a new experiment where we're looking at both um, cover crop rolling and some other approaches to reducing tillage. So I wanted to just mention a few um, challenges with this system um, because this system is being promoted to growers, this ro roller crimper system and uh, no-till planting into very heavy cover crop residue. We had a lot of equipment problems and, um, of planting through that residue. And here you can see the seed. This is underneath the mat of cover crops. And you can see the planter had a very hard time getting into soil. So you have corn seed left on the surface, and here is uh, soybean. So that's a challenge. Um, really, it's an engineering problem um, to be able to make this system work better. We need to improve. Um, our planting. Okay, so this has been a problem for all of our cover crop reduced till work. And that is, um, you have to be really good at managing your cover crops in these systems because if you don't, they come back as weeds. So this is rolled rye, and this is a uh, hairy vetch coming through that rolled rye from the previous year in the rotation. And so we're working out our timing of, um, of termination with the roller crimper. And um, initially, we just used one pass to roll over the uh, cover crop. And now we're using two. We're using one before planting. Then we plant. And then we wait for a few days. And we come back and we roll again to make sure that we get better control of that cover crop. Um, the early, when we try to terminate at that early date, we get a lot of cover crop coming back up. It's not ready to kill. And if we wait too late, the um, initiation of seed maturation has, has happened in some of the cover crops. And even though you knock down the cover crops, they can continue to mature seed. And, and then they have a nice residue covered, uh, good soil moisture place to established. This is um, rye uh, cover crop that has come in through uh, soybeans. So this is a this has been a real challenge in this uh, roll till uh, roll no till system or reduced till system. So overall from these different experiments in our transition to organic sort of the sort of the there was a lot going on there. <laughs> um, in the transition, we do find the abundance and diversity of arthropods increases during the transition. We've seen that in these three different um, projects, um, with the primary effects being the current year um, practices and crop. Uh, we had highest um, abundances or activity densities in corn and lowest in soybean, and that was pretty consistent across um, all three experiments. And we also, uh, in all three experiments, saw that predation rates increase with predator numbers. So that's good. So the bug story, the insect story, is actually pretty good in our area. Um, I don't know about in the south how that would be. But our pe press pre pest pressure was low, and we did not really have any um, significant pest pressure arise during this w with this increase in arthropods. In terms of soil disturbance, the effects are variable. When we look at those different biplots, we see that some uh, arthropods are um, tolerant of um, disturbance, while others are less so. We get association of some insects with some of the systems and not others. But in general, 
Uh, most of the taxa can um, tolerate most of the systems that we used. Pests did not generally increase with reduced tillage, and the predators were not reduced by tillage in the same uh, sense. Tillage um, at, the, at the levels of disturbance that we had did not have a strong effect and that predators can recover from tillage in some landscapes. OK, so this is, these are experimental plots. I think they're, most of the plot sizes are 90 by 90 feet, and they do cover a large area. That one experiment was 15 acres. The first two were eight acres. And so there could be some, you know, these predators are very mobile. They could be moving in from the edges, but um, it, and that may help explain why uh, tillage did not have a very negative effect. And it would be interesting to see what would happen if you did this in, say, a 100-acre field, in the, in the middle of a 100-acre field, if you would um, have the same lack of negative um, effects of tillage on uh, these beneficial organisms. Cash crop species, again, we um, did in every case, we had greater arthropod abundance and diversity in corn compared to soybeans. Um, and even though um, we had greater predation. Yield was not related to arthropod pests or predator numbers. Uh, weeds were really the driving factor. And we did also have some soil nitrogen issues where we're reducing tillage. OK, so cover crop species and management. Um, in general, um, the effects of cover crops on um, is positive on predators and predation, but it really depends on cover crop. We, in that rye cover crop, we tended to have lower um, uh, predator abundance than in where, where we have legumes. And um, within a season, I didn't show this data. Within a season, we also have a phenology thing going on where we're in, not only are we increasing through time abundance, but we're, uh, as we, we increase uh, numbers through the season. So as you delay your cover crop termination, you have greater numbers of arthropods and natural enemies as um, you wait to um, roll and plant. So sort of my big picture lessons learned um, in the transition, if perennial weeds are present, you cannot implement continuous reduced tillage. And transition is risky. You know, we lost money in some of those systems. Post-transition, these arthropod, you can shape these arthropod and weed uh, communities through management. Um, perennial forages were associated with lower weed populations and higher yields in the following annual crops and greater profitability, even though the number of disturbances and the soil disturbances were um, greater in those systems. And again, transition is risky. Problems with perennial weeds, lower yields, and returns with reduced disturbance. And in our last um, experiment, this uh, roll till really that reduced disturbance the most. This terminate the timing of termination of those cover crops is critical to avoiding weedy volunteer cover crops. <coughs> and that consistent cash crop establishment is very difficult in a heavy residue. Even when you have good equipment, we had to put a lot of weight on our equipment. And again, transition is risky. So kind of my long view is that, yeah, I kind of understand why these conventional <laughs> growers, they probably already understand these um, issues. And some of our growers have um, talked about that. But they do can overcome it. We have some very um, long uh, organic, long time organic crop farmers who have been very successful. But they are um, using conventionally like full tilt systems. And so we're continuing to work on trying to reduce uh, our approach to uh, tillage in these systems. OK. So thank you very much. For your I didn't hear uh, slugs being mentioned in this. OK. I'm glad you asked, because we have the Slugmeister, right, and John Tooker in our department. Mm -hmm. They have this big um, experiment right adjacent to our roll-till experiment. It's uh, long-term sustainable ag reduced inputs. 
they have got a problem with slugs. They're using uh, conventional seed treatments and GMO varieties. Mm -hmm. We have slugs. I have a slide with slug numbers. But we do not have the problem they have. And what they've seen in their that neighboring um, treatment and in lab experiments, Maggie Douglas, you might be familiar with her, did a lot of her research on this, is that the neonicotinoid seed treatments that are on um, those conventional crops are is detrimental to ground beetles. And so what they're finding is that their ground beetles are being suppressed by the neonicotinoids. The slugs are feeding on the um, crops that are treated with neonicotinoids just fine. Um, they're not affected at all by those. And so when the ground beetles eat those in, in toxic, you know, toxic slugs, the ground beetles are killed. And so that's really my sort of hypothesis that would need to be tested, that in those systems with those seed treatments, they're knocking down their natural enemies. And we are growing up this tremendous population of natural enemies. Um, so, so we're in the same kind of system. We have very heavy residue. We're reduced tillage. Slugs are a huge problem in conventional no-till in Pennsylvania. But we have slugs, but they were not really losing yield from them. And my only explanation right now, without doing an experiment, is has something to do with these natural enemy populations. This in your uh, second economic analysis, you showed a three-year lag before you began your project. Right. Was that in, uh, previously established, or was that that transition into certain In the second experiment? The second experiment. That was, that was, that grew out of that first transition. And no, we stopped the economic analysis at the transition and start over again. So that would be an interesting thing to look at over the six-year period if we were profitable or losing money still. So you started that one where we started it right, right, right in the next right. three years. Suppose because in the first three years you are you can't get um, a premium price right. for your crops, and now even if we have a sorry crop, we can sell it at a price premium once we're certified organic. And so, you know, if we don't have the yields we want or, you know, we even lost crop production, hopefully a farmer wouldn't do that. You know, we're researchers, not farmers, and we try. But we face the real difficulty in reducing that tillage by having cover crops get away from us. So it takes, a, I think, a lot of experience to be able to manage these organic systems. And I think that's where, like, sort of the labor and management. I mean, it's, I don't think it's for everybody, <laughs> right? Do you have any plant parasitic nematode structure? We didn't. Why not? Look. So oh, yeah. Really, <laughs> that would be a great thing. We don't have a pathologist either. I know. I so we're pathologist. very, like, sad about that. We have, but uh, we haven't had, I'd say, pathogens in our system right now. Not saying that it couldn't happen. We haven't really had a problem. We had alfalfa, but we were using things like, you know, we have a leaf ho hopper tolerant alfalfa, so we didn't really have trouble with leaf, um, leaf hopper damage. And that guy um, links. Not that I know of. There was like no white spot. So, so you, you did show that the corn and soybean yields increased after the perennial forages. Yes. So was that. Um, Possibly because of the nitrogen? That possibly nitrogen. could be because now we have a biogeochemist working with us on these the new projects. Because in the reduced tillage corn, oh, you could tell that they were nitrogen limited. Um, they didn't look, they weren't as big, they didn't look as good, their color wasn't as good. We still got pretty good yields for organic corn. Like I think we were getting 120 to 160 bushels, which is good for those organic systems, um, especially for how weedy they were. And, um, but you could, you could walk out into the field and go, that's the no-till plot. That's the, you know, after alfalfa till plot. Because um, just the color of the plants and the size of the plants. And um, in that second um, experiment, they did do a, a nitrogen test. And I don't know the results of that. They put in some non-nodulating soybeans. And then they also did some nitrogen supplementation test with um, Chilean nitrate, which is an um, organically approved nitrogen source. And um, 
their so that they could tell just what was going on with the nitrogen in that system. And unfortunately, I can't even tell you what that was. But we were definitely, nitrogen limitation is a problem, and we were paying a lot more attention to how we apply our manure, when it's um, applied. What That's the reason also for including hairy vetch. A lot of our farmers don't want anything to do with hairy vetch because it can be a, a weed. If the, it has hard seed, if it is carried over in those systems, it'll come back as a weed in small grains. And, uh, but it, it produces like 120 pounds of nitrogen. So, so we need high nitrogen cover crops. We need manure that is not applied at over phosphorus, you know, levels that could result in leaching. And so we have this new cover crop project where we're kind of looking at cover crop mixes that can both supply nitrogen and retain nitrogen. Also, we had the biogeochemist looking at nitrogen leaching, and after every tillage event, we get a big like potential for nitrogen leaching. So that's another reason to really kind of cut that down, because you're losing nitrogen from the system every time you have a tillage event. Otherwise, it just kind of, the supply and retention kind of is in balance in, in these mixed cover crops. But we do have nitrogen limitation. All right, let's thank um, Mary and there are refreshments afterwards right outside the door.